Sounds True presents The Enlightened Brain, The Neuroscience of Awakening, with Rick Hansen, author of Buddha's Brain. And now, session one, Self-Directed Neuroplasticity, with Rick Hansen. Hello, I'm Rick Hansen. I'm a neuropsychologist and a meditation teacher and someone who's been very interested personally since the early 1970s in how to actually be truly, deeply happy. Not the happiness based on circumstances. I grew up in a basic lower middle class environment in the suburbs of Los Angeles, so not the happiness based on getting a new toy as a kid or as a grown up, a different kind of toy, let's say, like a new car, but the profound happiness, the profound sense of inner peace, love, delight, and wisdom you can sense in the great teachers in all the world's traditions. I wondered, how did they do it? Perhaps some kind of mysterious grace was involved, you know, the interventions of God or some kind of transcendental factor. But other than that, these people who seemed to have found a way to a deep, enduring, unconditional well-being and inner peace had to engage causes that led to results, namely their own unshakable happiness, love, and wisdom. The question was, of course, how could regular people like me and others engage those same causes and do this in the middle of a busy modern life, not in a cave somewhere in Tibet? That inquiry into how to actually do it led me to the brain, which is the final common pathway of all the causes streaming through you as you to construct moment by moment your experience and your actions. In other words, whether I or you or anyone is happy or frazzled, confident or uneasy, loving or nasty, clear-headed or clouded, focused or distracted, inspired or downhearted, or in a stable state of mind, or contracted and confused. This all depends on what is happening inside the brain. Until recently, spiritual practitioners or anyone else who was interested in the upper reaches of human potential, or simply anybody who is tired of feeling anxious, frustrated, unfulfilled, depressed, or simply at sea in life, needed to do practices of one kind or another without knowing anything about how those practices worked inside the brain or whether they worked at all. Certainly, many practices do work. For example, the Buddha did not need an MRI to find his own awakening. The material in this program is no replacement for traditional practices. I have enormous respect for traditional practices and their benefits for me for my teachers, and for my teachers' teachers, stretching all the way back into the myths of prehistory, since our earliest ancestors, probably several million years ago, first looked up at the stars with awe and longing. What I've tried to do here is to ground traditional practices, particularly from the spiritual tradition I know best, Buddhism, as well as from Western psychology and, more broadly, the human potential movement, to ground these practices in the brain. In other words, what's actually happening in the brain when someone is unconditionally happy, loving, and wise? What's happening in the brain when someone is deeply absorbed in meditation, even in non-ordinary states of awareness? Or, swinging for the fences here, what could be happening in the brain of someone who's enlightened? By which I mean, a brain that no longer can allow any form of greed or hatred or delusion to arise. With the recent breakthroughs in modern neuroscience, which has literally doubled its body of knowledge in about the last 20 years, we can increasingly begin to get some decent answers to these questions. Then we can engage a kind of reverse engineering, 
In other words, by knowing with increasing clarity and specificity something about what's going on in the brain when someone is in a positive or wholesome or even exalted state of mind, then we can use the power of the mind alone to stimulate the neural substrates underlying those wholesome states of mind and thereby strengthen them. Because, as you'll hear me talk about later in the famous saying from the work of the Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb, neurons that fire together wire together. In short, if you stimulate positive neural substrates, you strengthen them over time. This creates a wonderfully positive cycle in which positive activities today strengthen the neural substrates of increasingly positive states of mind tomorrow, which then in turn strengthen the neural substrates of really positive states of mind the day after, leading to confidence and faith and conviction that if you keep going down the long and winding path of awakening, you will really progress in this process, perhaps, hopefully, all the way to the very end. Along that way, knowing something about your own brain can have four kinds of benefits. One, it offers an organizing framework that's a kind of big basket that can contain all the various theories in psychology or practices in psychology or all the various perspectives in the spiritual traditions or practices in the spiritual traditions that, at least in some ways, boil down to something we're actually doing in our own minds and our own brains distinct from some transcendental X factor. Because apart from the role, who knows, that something mysteriously divine might play, at the end of the day, whatever practices we're engaging have got to be working our own brains. So knowing something about how the brain works offers an organizing framework. Second, Grounding methods for personal healing or psychological growth or spiritual practice in the brain can be very motivating. As you increasingly appreciate that what you're doing in daily life or in your therapist's office or on the meditation cushion is actually changing your brain for the better over time, that can really help you stay with the path of awakening, including through its tough patches. Third, knowing something about the brain can highlight which of the many, many methods in the large warehouse of psychological or spiritual tools are actually most useful to you. If you're a monk or nun living in the 24-7 tumbler of monastic life, grinding and polishing every day, then you can kind of afford to let the process unfold on its own. On the other hand, if you are a householder, in other words, someone living in the world, maybe raising a family, maybe paying a mortgage, going to work, paying taxes and all the rest, someone who has limited time for psychological or spiritual practice, then it's important to find methods that really work for you, are highly efficient and effective, and are tailored to your own individual neurology. Finally, in the fourth benefit, occasionally knowing something about the brain can suggest a genuine new innovation in method. One example of that in psychology is the development of neurofeedback in which people are getting feedback about brain waves in real time, like people used to be getting biofeedback about things like their heart rate. And because you're getting feedback about what your brain is actually doing, you're able to increasingly draw your brain into a more positive place. Of course, no single program of any kind, including this one, can just give you an enlightened brain. But in this program, you will learn about what's plausibly happening in the brain during very deep states of joy, inner peace, meditative absorption, and liberating insight. And what you can actually do day by day to activate and therefore strengthen those neural substrates of real happiness, inner strength, 
and wisdom. Helping you to move as far and as fast as you can go toward your own enlightened brain. So let's begin. This program consists of six sessions. First, self-directed neuroplasticity, in which I'll be talking about how the brain works all together, the relationship between the mind and the brain, and what I mean by the term mind, and then in particular, some of the things you can actually start doing immediately to build greater...